Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're continuing on our mission to understand the full meaning of what light actually is. And so we left off last time with the advent of the, of the wave theory of light being dominant in all in modern physics and 19th century physics. Well, the next step in this whole thing is to actually really determine how the wave propagates. So, and also linking things. We're gonna find that there's some amazing things that occur as we, go, as we look. So in 1831, a great experimentalist by the name of Michael Faraday, who was also at the London Royal Society, he discovered through lots and lots of experiments, he was just a real tinkerer. And so as he tinkered with things, he found that if he took a magnet and he moved it across a wire, it creates a current. And so this is called an induction. So it's in uh, electric field, in, an electric field was induced by the magnet. So Michael Faraday uh, said, wow, if I take a current, if I take a loop of wire and put a voltmeter on it, which can measure the uh, voltage that's going, and you pass a magnet across and the voltmeter uh, swings. That means that there's a, some sort of electromotive force. That's what he devised, they called it. So electromotive force actually caused a current. So we could actually create a current by simply moving a magnet near a wire. And a wire is a conductor, meaning it allows electricity to go through it. So this is an experimentally derived thing. And the behavior now is going to need to, he, he doesn't have an exact definition for it, but yet now we, he's getting an idea of how things work. So this is interesting that it was discovered that if you take a magnet and pass it across a conductor, like a wire in a loop, you get, uh, you get a current, you get an electric current, you can get a shock from that. All right, so he then, but uh, the funny thing is, is that Michael Faraday himself was no mathematician. He regarded himself not even as that. It was something that was very difficult for him, but yet, and he, uh, and, but yet he, was, he had an incredible way of actually visualizing things. Um, the next thing he did is he went along in about 1845, about 14 years later, he then discovered that with polarized light, now firmly established as a concept. So if you take polarized light and apply a strong magnet to it, the light can be rotated by the polar, by the magnet. So light can be rotated in the presence of a magnet. So Michael Faraday is saying, well, there's, there's just got to be this enormous connection between electric fields and magnetic fields and light. There must be some kind of connection because look at this. I can rotate a polarized beam of light by applying a magnet to it. It's called Faraday rotation. It was discovered in 1845. Well, 1846 comes along, he starts really getting his head around this stuff, and he visualizes a concept of the nature of how light propagates. He doesn't think of it as propagating through a medium. What he instead thinks of it is the medium itself, are, he describes field lines. So you can say, well, there's a source, and the source affects something at a distance. So there's a line that is a that is maybe the electric field, and the, the source has an electric field. You can detect it by placing test particles or whatever in various places. You can detect its strength by placing test things near an electric source. Um, that's why, you know, if you have a magnet, you can say, well, if I, how close do I bring the magnet? So you can change the magnet, the magnet's location as you move it, and it'll induce different currents. It's not the same current. If the, if the, if the magnetic magnet is like 10 feet away, it won't induce the same current as if it's right next to it. So that implies that there's a strength of the field. And so Michael Faraday visualized this field as a series of lines emanating out from the source, either a magnetic source or an electric source, and he envisioned that the that light itself was not traveling in, say, water or something like that, but instead was a disturbance of these field lines. So the light, the field lines extended out, and when light was transmitted, it, it changed the field, and it was a change in field lines and a disturbance in there, or vibrations on these field lines, and that's what he considered to be the nature of light, is a vibration on field lines. It's a wave. It has wavelength, it has a distance, it has an amplitude, and so you can think of it as plucking a string. So the field lines themselves would go from source to destination, and the disturbance in them is a pluck, 
and that makes a that makes a wavelength. So it's a very interesting idea. And in fact, if you look at introductory uh, introductory as uh, electromagnetic textbooks or even gravity textbooks, you see the concept of the field line. And this was developed by Michael Faraday as a helpful visual tool for us to understand things. In fact, a lot of people still use this as a dominant way of teaching the concept of an electric field. And we still use the word electric field that Michael Faraday came up with. All right. So what's fascinating is, uh, so Michael Faraday even went even further to say that nothing actually feels the source. It only feels the field that the source creates. So he then said, well, what his a classic argument in, in utilizing gravity as an idea is that what if you took the Earth or what if the sun didn't have any planets around it at all and magically, boom, you drop the Earth in its proper place? What would it do? How would it behave? You say, well, it would have to behave according to the, gra the field lines that are present as a result of the sun. So you don't even need to have the test particle there, meaning the earth, meaning an electron, meaning something that actually generate that senses the field in order for the field to be there. The field is just there waiting to be accessed. That was his argument. And that kind of helps us visualize the nature of what we mean by an electrical field or a magnetic field. So it's a fascinating thing that it's there, that it's present, and that disturbances in it are what we call light. And that's a, it, it, his idea was, was powerful visually and helped a lot of people understand things and in fact is used today extensively. All right. But remember that, that Faraday was a visual idea thinker and wasn't a mathematician. So he had a, couldn't put it in a way that could be manipulated, uh, in, manipulated quantitatively very well. All right. So then coming up, a pro, just under 20 years later, in 1864, James Clerk Maxwell created the mathematical links that then solidified everything that we know about electricity and magnetism. He created and linked together four equations, starting with Michael Faraday's induction equation, which he set down as a mathematical treatise that related the current to a moving magnet. And so if there's a current, there must have been a moving magnet. And then he also took Carl Friedrich Gauss's equations that, that govern the electric field and govern the magnetic field, uh, that these things existed. And so Carl Friedrich Gauss's two equations he pulled in. And then finally, he pulled in André Marie Ampere's law, which then just said that a magnetic field is created by a changing electric field or by a steady current, a steady electric current. So. Ampere's law combined with Gauss's law of electric fields and Gauss's law of magnetic fields and Faraday's law of induction, they became James Clerk Maxwell's four laws of electromagnetism. And so Maxwell is considered the granddaddy of all this by taking these disparate ideas, formalizing them mathematically, putting them together and showing how they're all interrelated. So these four equations link the electric field, the magnetic field, currents, changing currents, position in space, changes in time to all of these things. All these things are all interlinked. And so if you solve the equations for, say, a simple wave equation, in fact, you could actually put them together and say, well, how does a wave equation fall out of this? And uh, James Clerk Maxwell's equations allow for a wave solution for them. And a wave solution simply means is that there is a disturbance inside a field and it propagates. And so how does it propagate? It propagates through space at a given rate, which means it propagates at some speed. And the funny thing is, is that Maxwell said, well, there's these two constants that are endemic inside of the in, uh, two physical constants that are measurables that are part of his four equations. And one of them is the permeability of free space of biomagnetic field. And another one is, is the permittivity of, uh, of uh, permittivity of, of permittivity and permissivity of magnetic fields and electric fields in free space. And so it measures just how easy it is for an electric field to make it through space and how easy it is for magnetic field, electric fields and magnetic fields to make it through space. So it's a measure of how the effectiveness is because as you take, an, uh, as you take a magnet and move it closer, uh, moving magnet, move it closer to a current, it doesn't all of a sudden, just, there is a way that it does that. It's not that it, you could change the rate at which it does it, but there is a, uh, there's a definite translation constant or a number that says, well, if I'm moving it this fast, 
then that's how much current we're going to get over here. And it's always the same, no matter who does the experiment. So these are universal constants. And if you combine these two constants about the permissivity and permittivity of electric and magnetic fields in space, he found he got, he found he got the speed with which the electromagnetic disturbance passed through space. And that, he said, was strikingly close to the speed of light as measured experimentally during the course of, uh, around the time. So he said, this is too close to be a thing. And it's very well shown by, by Faraday rotation that light and electromagnetism are all one thing. So therefore, light must be the thing that we call a disturbance in the electromagnetic field. So this is an amazing deduction that, that he did. He took all these experimentally derived things and linked them together in one coherent thought or four coherent thoughts and said, here's the sources of electric fields, the sources of magnetic fields, how they interact with each other, and then derive a wave equation from them relatively simply. It's what you do in first quarter electromagnetism in a college class. And what you eventually find is that the speed with which the wave propagates equals the speed of light. And in fact, it was looked at more and more carefully and said, yes, this is exactly the speed of light. So this is a fascinating thing. How fast do the disturbances move? They move at the speed of light. So therefore, the disturbances in electric magnetic fields is light. That's a really crazy thought. So what is, happens? What's happening when you move a magnet next to a current? Light's being exchanged. That's what it is. Virtual particles or particles of light are being exchanged. What's their wavelength? Why don't we see them? Okay. This is a very fascinating concept. So all wavelengths then, uh, Clerk Maxwell found that, Maxwell found that inside this wave equation, there wasn't any restriction on the wavelengths of light. So they could be anything. It just so happened that visual wavelengths are very, that's a very narrow region. It's a very small set, subset of all possible wavelengths. So he said, well, there's gotta be other wavelengths of light. There must be. And in fact, there had been known to be other wavelengths of light. You remember he did his work in 1864, but back in 1800, Sir William Herschel had discovered infrared light. And William Herschel discovered infrared light, which we'll talk about more when we talk about infrared telescopes. But William Herschel discovered infrared light by putting a thermometer in a box under a, after a prism broke out all the light and then found that the sunlight that was not hit was where it was dark inside the box. The, the light was actually the thermometer was actually raising in darkness. So and to the same amount that the thermometers raised in the presence of the beam of light as, as was spread out by a prism. So since it was past the red, it was in a dark region that he couldn't see, but yet it behaved as though it was getting illuminated. He called it infrared light. Also in 1888, just a, just a few short years after Maxwell published his equations, radio wavelengths were discovered by Heinrich Hertz. And then X-rays were discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. And in 1900, gamma rays were discovered. So it was all wavelengths were possible. And, made, and they were quickly discovered after and when, as technology arose to allow them to be discovered. So then it becomes a fascinating real question. There's this speed of light. That's how fast light is transferred. Well, here's the funny thing. Speed with respect to what? Really? What's it have this? Because it's just a speed in there. And the electromagnetic equations say that it's going at this speed. Also, notice that if we think about all the ways people talk about light, they always in some way assume some sort of medium in which light is traversing. So light must traverse using some kind of medium. And uh, even though Michael Faraday said, well, there's no such thing as a medium, there's just these field lines. Um, Everybody thought that there must be some medium in which light propagates. And so the latter part of the 19th century, the greatest effort was to determine this medium. And it was called the ether. And the ether, A-E-T-H-E-R, means just some other element. It's Aristotle's putative fifth element. Uh, there's earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And that was Aristotle's concept of, of, the, of the nature of light. So what's fascinating is that the, uh, but nobody knew what it traversed in. 
What does light traverse it? And we'll get to that next time. See you soon.